Psalm 95, verse 7, the tail end of it. Uh, I want you to see that part where it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, mm-hmm. harden not your heart. That's eight there. As in the provocation, and as in the, 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 will, the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath they should not enter into my rest. But I wanted to bring that out from Psalm 95. Now, if you go to Hebrews chapter 3, you'll see here uh, verse 7. It says exactly what we just got through reading in Psalms. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I want to also point out, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of unbelief. There's people who frustrate when, you, when you're trying to learn the word, and you're trying to stand on the word, and then you've got people that are supposed to know better, and they teach things that are not true concerning the word. For instance, saying that the, uh, the word of God is not necessarily inspired. I don't know how much you've heard of it, but there's a lot of people that will say the word of God is not inspired. They'll say, like, um, they'll believe in evolution instead of the account of Genesis. They'll, be, they'll say that, well, Moses didn't really write the five books of Moses, and that we don't know who any of the authors were. And the prophets, they, they talk about Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah was, was not one prophet. It was at least two or more and they, they come up with all this goofy stuff. Mm-hmm. But I want you to notice here what the Scripture says. Because all we should really care about is what the Scripture says, right? Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice. What is he doing? He's quoting from Psalms. But the neat thing is, he didn't say, as David said. See, if he said it as David said, then you could say, well, it was the prophet David. No, he says the Holy Ghost said it. Now, who's the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is God, right? right? And this is just one among other, you know, many uh, scriptures that shows that what we have in this book is the word of God. So, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. This is just what we read in Psalms. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works for 30 years or 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with their generation and said they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And then if you jump down to verse 16, it says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. In other words, not everybody provoked God. Uh, There's two people we know for sure. Two spies out of 12. Do you remember that? Who were the two good ones? Joshua and Caleb. Well, that's what he's, That's exactly what he's referring to. He says. He says uh, uh, some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all of them. Not all of them did. Not all that came out of Egypt did, by the hand of Moses. But with whom was he grieved for forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell into the wilderness? And I want you to see. It says to those who had sinned. And what we just got through reading, whether you read it out of Psalms or you read it out of Hebrews here, is that this unbelief to, to actually to doubt God's word is sin. None of us is going to have a full understanding of the word. It's just not going to happen in this life. Uh, I believe that uh, in the future we will know everything. When we, when we get to heaven, we will know everything. But right now, we're in the flesh. We have different gifts. We get different uh, understanding. Um, God is speaking to us in, in, in uh, different ways. But 
when we read something in the Word, we just got through seeing in verse 7, it said that as the Holy Ghost says. We know that the Word of God is what the Holy Ghost says. So if God was standing here today, right here in the midst, you know the Scripture does say, when two or more of you are gathered together, there, are, there am I in the midst of them, right? Well, if God was standing right in the midst of us and He said something... Would you believe him? But why do we have such trouble sometimes believing things that are out of the word? And all God's saying is, if you don't believe me, then you're in sin. Because you're not believing. The believing in God's word is actually trusting. Amen. Right? Even though we see the signs sometimes. A lot of times we see the signs and it doesn't do us any advantage. It should. It should. It should. 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 Well, you know, I'm kind of glad that he doesn't do that. I would have been dead more times than I can know. So... You know, he, I, I, I'm glad he doesn't deal with us like that. Nah, he, he's such a loving God. That's why he so many But we deserve it. Yeah. We deserve to get knocked oh, yeah. off. Yeah. Or, or, let, let's put it in, uh, sop- in Sopranos lingo. Uh, we deserve to get whacked. <laughs> right? So, uh, but when, with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? That means the sin was simply unbelief. Right. And he was grieved with them, which had unbelief or had sin, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. What he, well, he's asking the question here, and he, what he's, he's trying to get across is that to not believe God, to not trust God, is a very serious thing. And we've got whole churches that just don't, they don't, in fact, uh, Pastor and I uh, looked at a, a video, and uh, uh, today we were talking about uh, one of the one of the uh, pastors, and uh, you know he he's in a denomination that uh, doesn't believe in prophecy and doesn't believe in the millennium and doesn't believe in you know in the gifts of the spirit and you know it's on and on and on. Uh, why don't they believe? Don't they realize when they see something in the Word? That if they don't believe, it's sin. And this whole thing is warning. God is warning that it is possible that you will miss out on his best, is really what he's saying. We started this study saying that the book of Hebrews is not really about whether you're lost or not. It's not really about whether you're saved or not. It's about receiving the inheritance, And those are two different things. You can be saved and get up to the uh, Bema seat of judgment and not get any rewards whatsoever. In fact, uh, there's a saying, uh, saved by the skin of my teeth. Have you heard that one? And that just means I don't get anything. But you know what the good thing is? At least you're there. And that's the guarantee. When you, when you receive Jesus, he offers you that invitation and you are justified by faith alone. Now, why do we try adding things on there? You know, we get saved and then all of a sudden we start thinking that there's something we have to do. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief is just the opposite of faith. And remember, unbelief is sin. But let's go to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13. Uh, We're going to start at verse 1, but I'm going to skip over some things just because of time. Numbers 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Did you notice right in the middle, there's a phrase 
that should have prevented any of this from, from occurring, which we're going to read about, about the unbelief. Do you see it there? It starts with the word which. Oh, it was already given. It was already given. According to the word here, God said, send men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I already gave them. That's right. It's yours. It already belongs. To you. It already belongs. And the, but, the, but Hebrew says they couldn't enter in because of unbelief, right? And I would just throw this out. There's a lot of promises in the Bible. A lot of promises. Sometimes we, we are encouraged just by looking at some of those promises, right? But we all fall short. At least, at least that's been my experience. None of us is, is working on all eight cylinders. So he says he gave the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler. And Moses, by commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were, and then it mentions the ones who were the heads, um, from, uh, or the ones that would be sent from, um, from all the tribes here. And two, uh, let's see here. You got in verse eight. You got Oshia, the son of Nun. That's actually Joshua. We're, we'll see that they actually um, uh, Moses changes his name to Joshua, but it's Oshia to begin with. And uh, where's the uh, where's Caleb at? Caleb's in here too. Judah. Which verse? Six. Judah. Six? Yeah, Judah, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. These other ones, their names are not really so important because they're all going to drop dead. I just, you know, I hate to spoil it for you if you if you like reading that mystery and wait until you get to the end of the book. But I'm telling you, they're going to drop dead because of what they did. But the two we just mentioned, Joshua and Caleb... They brought back a good testimony, right? But if it wasn't for these other witnesses, and that what it is, is even though they were going out to spy the land, they forgot what he just told them in verse 2. I give the land. I gave the land already to you. Go and possess it. And that's exactly what we're going to see. Caleb says, we can take it, right? Well, you should really be that way about the promises in the word, Obviously, I need help, right? Things in my life are much bigger than I can do, than I can handle. But God is more than enough. God is more than enough. So verse 17, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Now you're all familiar with this story. Are you all familiar with it? It doesn't hurt going back over the word. And Moses sent them to the spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land which or what it is and, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. God is almost kind of like set, setting them up because he's telling them to bring a report on all these things, and they do. And, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring the fruit of the land. And now was the time, now the time was, uh, was the time of the first grapes. When we look at what God is telling them to go in to spy out the land and to observe this, write this down, observe this, write this down, right? What does the land look like? Who lives there? Are they living in cities? Are they living in walled fortresses? Do, are they weak? Are they strong? And this is going to be reflected in the response that they bring back. However, the error on their part is it doesn't matter what they find in the land. 
Because God, as we just saw, God already said he gave it to them. Right? Now, did they forget how there were ten plagues in Egypt? How he delivered them with a strong hand? How he parted the waters? How he went up to the mountain and they sinned. They had that golden calf. And then they were judged because of that, but God still had mercy. Have they forgotten all this? God did not have any intention of them thinking that he did all his powerful miracles and delivered them and got them all the way to the point of where they were going to enter into the land. Now, they've been around the wilderness for about two years right now. But do you think God did all that and then then was saying, okay, now I'm going to see if you got what it takes to go take that land by yourself. The scripture says, for we walk by faith and not by sight, right? So when you look and you say, well, the land is good or the land's not good, it doesn't matter because God is the one who's going to bless it, right? It doesn't matter if there's, and we'll see, there's giants in the land, but God, Caleb didn't. It did not affect Caleb. He said, "I can take it. We can take it." Remember the spoils they brought home. The spoils, the well, grapes, Israel and the Israel is experiencing that right now with milk and all everything they grow, with the nuts. It's just massive. Yeah, absolutely. Food. There's been a lot of favor. I yeah. How God has blessed that land. Absolutely. And if God didn't do that, they would not they would not have the wherewithal to defend themselves because they sell all that all over the world and they get money for it and then they can buy, they can have their military and they can, you know, so everything works together for those who love God, right? And even though I wouldn't say that Israel really loves God in the state that they are, so I'm sure some of them do. But for the most part, Israel is not Christian. Israel does not really know their God. Judaism is bankrupt. So they've been teaching a false message ever since the time of Christ because they rejected Christ. They don't want their people going to Christ and saying, okay, I, I believe this is the Messiah. So any, any way they, they shift, they turn, they twist, trying to get the people not to go to Christ. Which is a big problem. But God blesses them today, just like Pastor said. God blesses them today because it's His word at stake. It's His reputation at stake. So they went up, they searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron where... Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, who were these three? Anybody know? They were giants. The thing that gives us the key is they were the children of Anak. And in the Jewish, um, uh, I think it's the, the Midrash, uh, it, it uh, talks about, now, this is not scripture. But it talks about how big these giants were. And it, it, it mentions a, a fourth one. And that was, these were male. And then there was, suppose, and I think this could just be a myth because it's not in the scripture, right? But they said that the, the female giant was so strong and so large that when the 12 spies were hiding, they hid under some type of covering and she removed the covering, not picking it up and moving it out of that area without even knowing that there were 12 people in it. That's strong. So you got three giants, Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. Now this is one cluster of grapes. 
What you're seeing here is God said, check out the land and see if it's fruitful, right? Bring back proof, and that's what they're going to do now. So they cut down the branch with one cl- just one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two, two people upon st- a staff or staves, right? They were carrying it kind of like they carry the ark, right? That's how big this one cluster was. And you see pictures of it, and you know the the artist's conception is that you know the the man the men are are uh, carrying on their shoulders, and the grapes are almost touching the ground or so there's so many grapes in that cluster. The place was called Brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence, and they returned from searching of the land after forty days. Now that 40 days is important. The number 40 usually refers to a time of testing. And that's what this is for them. It's a time of testing. Now they're going to fail the test, unfortunately. We also see 40 days uh, with something having to do with Jesus. Anybody, do any, no, you know what it is, 40 days? He fasted too. Yeah, the temptation is what I'm referring to. The temptation of Christ. He was tested. The Bible says that he was tested in every possible way. Any way that we're tested, he was tested as well. I mean, just think of it. He he didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And that, that right there is impossible. For you to go without food and water. He didn't have any water. Without food and water for 40 days... God had to keep him because he was out there in the wilderness, right? God had to keep him. There's been a few that have been able to do that. They believe that Moses was also, he was up the mountain top for 40 days and 40 nights and doesn't say anything about him bringing any food. He didn't know how long he was going to be. He was in the presence of God. It tells me when you're in the presence of God, the laws of this world don't really apply. Right, right. God is above the laws. Right. Amen. Uh, Elijah's another one. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I wouldn't recommend that you go on 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, some people claim that they've done it. Uh, I don't know because... Um, a true fa- a true fast is strictly water, right? You don't ha- you don't have any food at all. Now a lot of a lot of times when people tell you that they've gone on extended fast, you'll find out that it wasn't water. You know, they they were maybe they were having some soup or they were they, you know they were eating something, and they're calling it a fast, which is fine, but that's not the same fast as Jesus went on, right? Anyway, so 40, the, the point here, and I kind of get diverted, 40 is, means test, period of testing. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Well, that should make them believe, right? God... Look at the fruit. I mean, it is a fruitful place. It's a good land. They told him, and and they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. That's an expression. You'll see it in the scripture. Flowing with milk and honey just means prosperous, right? Very fruitful. Flowing with, doesn't mean that they brought back milk and honey, Okay. Uh, flowing with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be str- See, nevertheless is where they failed, right? If they would have left it like that, if they would have taken the fact that in verse 2, he said, I give this land to the peop- the children of Israel, I already gave it to you. And then they see the fruitfulness, but they didn't leave it there. They started reporting what they saw. And that's what they were sent to to report. But watch the attitude. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Was that a fact? Yes, that was a fact. These were giants. There are also... Now, there's going to be people out there that are going to try to shake your your, uh, faith on the giants. 
Some people say, well, you know, there's giant, there was, uh, there was David and Goliath, which is true. But most of them don't know that Goliath had brothers, and they were also giants. The, the book of Genesis tells us there were giants in, in the, way back then, when, in the time of Noah, and even after that. And when you go into the uh, Pentateuch, you can see, and we're in the Pentateuch, but when you go into various uh, scriptures in the Pentateuch, you can see all of these giants that were actually in the land. And we just got through seeing that there were some in the land. So when, when they said that the people be strong that dwell in the land, the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Again, that's children of Anak. That's the giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of the Jordan. And Caleb, now Caleb steps out. He's one of the twelve, right? He says, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, was he saying in his own strength, do you think? Or was it because he knew God had given him the land? That's how faith talks. Faith doesn't look at the circumstances. Faith looks at what the Word of God said. Right. Whether you can understand it or not, you, you don't have to have the solution to believe. We don't. We have precious promises, and many of us believe. I hope you all believe in the in the coming of Jesus and the rapture of the church. How do we know? We 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 never saw the rapture of the church. How do we know? It's it's God. It's true because of the Word of God. Amen. We we hear the Word of God. We study the Word of God, and we have faith. Just like Caleb says, "Let us go up at once and possess it." We are well able to overcome it. And those things that uh, just just to add on to this, j- those things that God has personally called you to do, because I don't know what it is. But you may have an inclination, and you should have an inclination of what God would have you to do. He has empowered you already. You are well able to overcome it. Nowhere does it say it's easy. The life of faith is not easy. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people. Wow, what a confession. They come back with, there's no way we can take them. Now, were they looking at God's promises or in their... They're looking at each other. They're looking at each other. They're, they're like, the twelfth chosen might have been the best of the, the litter, you know? And they looked at each other and said, we can't take them, right? Have, have you ever had challenges in your life where you knew? Now, I know Pastor was talking this last week about when he started in the ministry, and for many years, right, you had all kinds of challenges, so they said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. That was a statement of truth. But it didn't matter. Right. It didn't, but it doesn't matter because right. they don't have God. And, and, and that's the whole point that Caleb's trying to get across. Yeah. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eats up the, eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the, the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And of course, now these professors in these seminaries and Bible schools and stuff, and I'm not talking about the good ones. There are some good ones that believe the word, but they'll say, well, you know, that was probably myth. That they, It was just in their imagination that there were really giants, but there were giants. The Bible says it, right? Now they've, um, pardon me, but they've unearthed uh, skulls that, you know, are just they're, they're, I mean, these skulls, they're definitely from some kind of creature, and they look human, and they're enormous, you know, and um, 
I mean, there, you know, you hear very little about them because, you know, anything that has to do with the Bible, you know, that proves the Bible to be right, you know, they kind of just put it off to the side, you know, and, you know, the rest of the world doesn't care about these, even breaking scientific discovery. It, it seems like breaking scientific discoveries are only revealed when it tries to back up, you know, like the theory of evolution. Yeah, that's exactly true. Something that, that, that correlates with the Bible, it kind of gets swept under the carpet a little bit, you know. Chapter 14, verse 1, Numbers. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. It said, all of them. Because they believed the ten. Right? I bet Moses is ready to rip his clothes off. He's so mad. He took them two years of this. And then they won't enter. And he's got to go back with them for the next 38 years. Right? And it was grace because we haven't seen the punishment laid out, but he gave him 40 years for 40 days, mm-hmm. right? A day for a year, which is important when you're looking at prophecy, a day for a year. But God was gracious in the fact that he counted those two years they already spent in the 40. So it was only 38 years. Time time served. (laughs) Time well served. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? They're going to get their wish. <laughs> and where, wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Do you, do you, see, do you see what this unbelief does? At first it's just, oh, we can't take it. We, we, we can't you know, take the land. It's almost like, did God really say this? But now they're murmuring against the leadership. And now they're saying all that. We should have died. Why did I ever become a Christian? I thought when I became a Christian, I was going to get all these treasures and, you know, and flowers every day. And I didn't really think I was going to get flowers. I just embellished that. <laughs> that was that was a long time ago. Anyway, that it's too long ago, but <laughs> And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. <laughs> let us go back to slavery. <clears throat> you ever seen those big things that they built in Egypt? Can you imagine that's what your job was? They were there for almost 400 years? I want to go back. Oh, man. What's that song we sing? I won't go back. I won't go back, right? (laughs) Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, uh, which were of them that searched the land. They rent their clothes. That's an expression that, oh, man, I've had it with these people. What am I going to do? You know, I can't take this. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search, it is an exceeding good land. They're still trying to convince them. But the, the, the enemy has gotten in there and stirred it up much worse, right? right? And the people start talking to the other people, and, and, they, and they said, let's make a captain. They already got a captain, but they're not happy with Moses. They want to go back to Egypt. God delivered them through the Red Sea, yeah. and they want to go back to Egypt. Do you think Pharaoh would have who just received, he probably would have <laughs> killed a lot of them. If the Lord, did, like he, lost all, he lost his armies in that, so he wasn't real happy. 
So he, they say the land which we pass through to search, it's, it's exceeding good land. Verse 8, if the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, or give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only, I'll add the word please, only please, please rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. It's the same thing, same attitude David said when he went after the, the giant. He said, that uncircumcised Philistine. He, he knew he didn't have a covenant with God. David had a covenant with God. And that's really what Joshua is saying. Right? Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. So fear them not, but all the congregation, it gets worse. All the, con- not some, all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Which kind of reminds me of the two witnesses in the future. Israel is going to face another trial and testing because two witnesses are going to be in Jerusalem in the time of prophecy. But, uh, and and we, we covered that, right? He gave us armor in the book of Ephesians, right? But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Now, this happened during those times. These people, they go, oh, well, 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 we, you know, we believed in the Lord. You saw him. You know, you saw him in a cloud. You saw him in a pillar of fire. Of course, you, you saw him part the waters. That's a whole lot different than what we're dealing with today. We're, we're trying to bank everything on the word. But Jesus said there's a special blessing for us who has not seen and believes, Right? Blessed are those who, who uh, see, having not seen, believe. And the Lord said in verse 11 unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? Now you remember that word provoke? That's what we saw in Hebrews and we saw it in the Psalms. Uh, because that, this is the issue we're talking about there. And we're going to jump back to Hebrews in a minute. How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? It's not just those. It was, what about the 12 plagues? The miracle, 12 miracles. I mean, what are these people nuts? Seems like it, but that's what unbelief does. And you, you know, you, you wonder because you, you try to talk to people. And they don't, they don't have faith. And you're like, are these people crazy? How can you go through life? I don't want to go through life without n- knowing God. Man, oh man. These people are nuts to go out and say, well, I'm an atheist. Man, you should at least fake it. <laughs> you should. You should. Verse 12 says, I will, God says, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them. And that disinherit, that word disinherit, that, that's an important word here because Hebrews is all about being disinherited. Not being saved versus unsaved, but losing your inheritance. And that's what he said. I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. That's a good deal for Moses, right? And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou brought us up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thou, or thy cloud, standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of a fire by night, Now, verse 15, now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness, and now I beg, and that's what would have happened, isn't it? When, if, if, if God would have slain them all, everyone would have said, 
See, he couldn't, he couldn't deliver that people. He couldn't bring them into the land. And that's what they want to say to you. When you, when you have a, a faith accident, when you're trying to believe and it just doesn't work out, yeah, just like he, people want to pick you apart. Did God really say that? Exactly. Don't, I don't believe. Don't have regret over when you, when you are in faith and if you fail... Have regrets when God's called you to do something and you don't have the faith to even begin. Because you don't start on the journey. You're definitely not going to get the inheritance, right? Or what God is, is wanting you to accomplish. And now, verse 17, I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. And, And the people of the world ought to hear this. You see, he says that he by no means will clear the guilty. Now, but I thought the gospel was he did clear the guilty. For those that receive. For those that receive. That's the thing they want to scratch out of your Bible. Mm -hmm. They would love to change Christianity so that part's not in there. Oh, God's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. Yes, but he's not going to, he can't. His nature does not allow him to forgive without the blood being shed. And if it's not shed on you, it's just like when, when he went, the, the angel of death went through Egypt and he killed everyone, the firstborn, not everyone, but the firstborn in every house that was not protected by the blood. And it was even the people in Egypt. And Pharaoh lost his own son. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Verse 19, pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people. So Moses is asking God, pardon them, forgive them of this great sin. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. So Moses is recounting, hey, this is not the first time, God. All these, all these times... You've shown us mercy. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Which is really great because he didn't, he could have had them, the ground open up and swallow them all. Right. right? But he didn't. He pardoned, he forgave them. However, he swears an oath here. He says, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. And I want you to see that they were enslaved in Egypt and they were delivered by, by the miracles in the hand of Moses. And then they walked through the water. They were baptized. And then they spent two, two years in the wilderness. That's like, it, it related to us, that's like growing in the Lord. God gives you a space. Grow in the Lord. Get serious with God. God is trying to straighten you out. But then there's going to come a time in your life. And you can go forward. And I'm not saying it's going to be exactly two years. But there's going to be a test when you're a new Christian. There's coming a time when there's a test. And you can go on or you can get sideways. And you won't make it. And you'll lose that part. Now, that doesn't mean if you return to God that you can't still go in that direction. But look at the time you've wasted. And somehow we think, well, and many Christians have this attitude, and it's really sad. Because they say, well, we're under grace. Therefore, it doesn't matter if I sin. Ooh. Well, and you know the Bible actually calls it deceitfulness of sin? Can you imagine? I mean, we, we may have already all been there. I don't know. I certainly have. Thinking, well, you know, it's, it, I'm, I'm human. Chastisement is just correction. 
It's God correcting you to lead you into the right path, to keep you on the right path. Sometimes he has to do it with a stick. And it's no different than when you wrote, you know, when your father and mother did it. Someone needs to take a stick to you sometimes. And God does that, usually by the spirit, right? What happens is your spirit gets grieved because you know, you know you failed God. And what you're really upset, you, you, you think you're upset because you failed God, but you didn't really fail God because God already knew you were going to do it. You failed yourself. And you can't look in the mirror anymore. And that's the, that's, when that happened, that's the Holy Ghost saying you need to repent, right? Because if the Holy Ghost wasn't after you, then you, you wouldn't repent and you wouldn't turn. You wouldn't feel bad. And that's why we can't continue to live in sin because the Holy Ghost won't let us. Right. He keeps bringing us back. Verse 23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, we have had a lot of confusion concerning this land. And there's been a lot of, there's been hymns where they talk about the land, the promised land, as if it was heaven. It's not what it represents. What it, because think about this. Their battles just began when they, got in the, when they got in that land. You don't have battles in heaven. The land represents your walk of faith now. Heaven is yet in the future. Like Abraham, the, and the victory comes through faith, just like they had to have faith, right? But what they, what they did, they were saved. That's what we have to see. They were saved. They were delivered. God promised he would deliver. He, brought, he delivered them. He had them baptized. He took care of all of their needs for two years in the wilderness. But he wouldn't let them enter into the land. But my servant Caleb, verse 24, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land where uh, into he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in this valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Sometimes God just, you know, he just gives you that little piece of information in parentheses there. Uh, translator actually puts it in parentheses, but because it seems like, well, what's the, you know, that doesn't seem to flow in context, but it's the word of God. God wanted it there. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? And so one thing that should prevent you from murmuring in unbelief is to see God calls you evil. It's evil to distrust God. It's evil not to believe. It's evil to murmur against God. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live. Now, here's the oath. As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered among you. Now, he's already pardoned them. He's pardoned them, but they're going to die in the wilderness. They're still going to... They're going to reap what they sow. And what's the message for us? Yeah, we've been pardoned. We've been, but if we continue on along that path, we will live to regret it. We may get eternal life, but it doesn't have to be as good as you've been, you know, you've been expecting. I want the good stuff. God's not really playing favorites and kicking them out because they were bad. Isn't aren't they part of a generational curse from Cain or, or really yeah, curse be Canaan? Ishmael, whoever came before them. Is yeah, their, it was the it was the sin that happened with uh, Noah. We're not really sure what it was. It seems like Noah might have. It, it just talks about him being. Uh, he was naked. He was drunk, and. It seemed like possibly it was just because he disrespected him. He didn't cover him up. But a lot of people believe that 
something happened, something sexual happened with Canaan, the grandson, and that's why he said, cursed be Canaan. And all the generation were cursed. And so the Canaanites were under a curse, just like you say. The Jews actually are, in a sense, too, because they said, let the blood be on our hands. And, and they're under a curse. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was also giants in the land. And the giants came from some unnatural relations with the sons of God and the daughters of men. That's where they came from in the first place. Noah already told us about that, or, or Moses told us about it in the time of Noah. And he said there were giants in the land because of that, and then afterwards as well. Well, we have to assume he's already told us how they got there. And so they must still be doing it. And I have news for people. Uh, Jesus said in the last days, he said it'll be like the days of Noah. So this stuff is still going on. But I want, what I want to do is drop down to verse 41. And I want you to see that now after, after Moses has had the, read the riot act, right? He said, I'm going to pardon you, but you're going to be punished. And you're not going to inherit. And then they get this idea, we'll go up and possess the land. We're going to take, now they want to take the land. Rather than get punished, right? <laughs> they rose up in verse 40. They rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and will go unto the place which the Lord has promised. For we have sinned. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? It shall not prosper. So th they thought they were going to fix what they did by more disobedience. Go, no, Moses said, go not up for the Lord is not among you that you be not smitten before your enemies for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you are turned away from the Lord. Thereof the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. And then verse 45, the Amalekites Malachites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill and they smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. And then they still, the ones who survived, still died in the wilderness. Right? Except for the 20 and under. And what, what, what doesn't come out here, the fate of the other 10, they were killed right there. They were killed. And that's why I said it, you don't have to, it doesn't matter who they were because they were there for a time and then they're not. And you know, it's kind of like that when, when we get to the other side and those people who have not been a part of us are not there. I don't think you're going to find them written in any book, their life written in any books. Now, I think there's a library of every one of us at God, just like he, he has these characters in the Bible. He keeps track of everything that you went through. Right. And one of the things, the books are going to be, he's going to be able to reward you because it's written in the books, right? But I don't think the people that are not going to be there are going to have any books. I think those are books are thrown in the fire also. But let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, in other words, getting your inheritance, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, is it possible we could miss it? Yes, or he wouldn't say that, right? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Unbelief has to go. If you're gonna if you're gonna fulfill your destiny and you're gonna get that reward, unbelief, you gotta kick unbelief out the window. 
For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore, now what he's doing here, he's bringing, you know, the earth was created in six days on the seventh day he rested and he's saying that that rest signified something important to us today just like this account says they couldn't enter into his rest so let's see what it has as he's saying Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's that psalm we read in the beginning, Psalm 95. For if Jesus had given them rest, now that that Jesus is not really the Jesus you're thinking. That's the word is Joshua. It's just in in Greek, the word the name Joshua is Jesus, which is interesting that Moses changed Joshua's name to Joshua. It was Oshia. He changed his name because the name means the salvation of Jehovah. And he would bring the salvation of Jehovah. He would bring them into the promise, right? But here he said, but, but truly, if, if Joshua would have given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Because Psalms comes after, right? And he's, he's rehearsing. He says, today, don't harden your, don't provoke him and harden your hearts. As in the, in, in the day of provocation. Because he swore you would not enter in your rest. Verse 9 says, there remaineth therefore a rest. To the people of God. Now this word rest in verse 9 is not the same as the rest of them. The word here is the word Sabbath. And it says, there remaineth therefore a Sabbath to the people of God. Now let me tell you about the Sabbath. What he's saying, he equated it with creation. He said it represented there's a there's an inheritance right? There's a rest. And then he says, but there does remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God. But here's where we get confused over it. He didn't tell us that we had to keep it with all the Judea, or the, the laws of Judah. In fact, I will tell you this, you do not have to follow those laws in the Old Testament because you're justified by faith. However, there's spiritual truth to help you grow. It is the Word of God. And you will get spiritual insight from that. But you know what we should do? Now, I would love if we did this in the church. If the church adopted the Sabbath and we would come and we would praise. But you don't, it's not that you have to do that. God's not holding anything against us. It's just that the early church wanted to separate itself from Israel. And it's a whole long story. We are where we are. But we're not supposed to either keep the the Sabbath and become in bondage to the Sabbath. Then I have to worry. Uh, In fact, if you take the law, in the Sabbath you couldn't carry any burden. You couldn't carry anything. So what that would mean to us, if you have false teeth, you can't wear them that day. You couldn't kindle a fire so you can't start a fire. You, you can't start your car because you can't kindle a fire. You could you couldn't go on your on your range on the, on your stove. You could. I mean, right there. I mean, it's, it's how are you going to meet those laws? Even turning on the light is kindling a fire. That's right. That's In other right. words, you're supposed to spend your whole night in dark darkness. You can't light candles because it's the Sabbath. Was- yeah. Right, and that's what I'm trying to... The distinction is there, there is a, a Sabbath rest. That's what he's bringing up. There remains a Sabbath because there's always been a Sabbath rest. But when it got to the law, they made... It's, it's actually the ones who polluted it so much 
is the Jew, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they did you know they took they took a the Mo, laws of Moses. Uh, there's about 613 laws in the laws of Moses. Do you know the Jews expanded that to like 5,500? Wasn't you could, you didn't know what you, you know, you'd be walking down the street and they said, you can't do that. You have sinned, yeah. right? How would you know 5,500 different laws? And Jesus didn't pay any attention to him. And that's what made them so mad. He thought he broke the Sabbath all the time. And he said, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man, right? right? It was Sabbath was not to put put uh, men in bondage, but it is. It still exists today because it's celebration and it's looking forward to that inheritance. And every time we do celebrate it, we're celebrating that there's an an inheritance we're gonna we're going to get. So I do celebrate it in my spirit. Everything should set you free. Jesus Everything should set you, set you free. That's right. The Sabbath should set you free. I can worship him every day and any time, any day. Not just one day a week. I'm not limited. I studied this a lot in the Sabbath because it was a real issue for me. Because God said keep the Sabbath. And, I, and right here I show you. He says there remains a Sabbath. And I thought, how, how do I do this? How do I... And I kept falling back into the law. And you'll notice all these people that call themselves Messianic. And, and they're the Hebraic. Now they call them Hebraic. It's great to study Hebrew. It's great to understand, to be able to look at the Hebrew. To, to, uh, to, to go there. But you don't need to adopt all those customs which they couldn't keep. Ten commandments. Four of them had to do with worshiping God. And six of them had to do with how you treat your fellow man. And many teach that there were four on one tablet and six on the other. There's no way to know for sure. But it sounds good. He did break them. Yeah. And there used to be 15. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Moses forgot. God told him. Go, go, God told him to re- recreate those tablets, and he just felt, he forgot the other five. <laughs> I mean, you can't blame you can't blame Moses, right? I mean, he's forgetful. <laughs> but I, I don't go away saying that I'm teaching that because I'm not teaching that, okay? <laughs> so he's been talking about rest. Now, rest. If you say, you get home from work, say, man, I'm going to put my feet up and rest. And you know what rest means? I'm gonna, for me, a lot of times it means I'm going to sit here in front of that TV until I go to bed. <laughs> You know, and that's bad too to sit there in front of the TV. But sometimes you just, you that's rest. A cessation of work is rest, right? But interesting, he says, after he tells us there remains a rest for the people of God, he that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. What he's saying there is, hey, you were saved. You are justified by faith. You need to trust and rest in that justification. That's what you're saved in. Not obeying this law or obeying that law or trying to do this or trying to... Don't add anything to your life and your responsibilities that God didn't put on you. It's hard enough. And, I mean, you, repent from your sin. Do what you're supposed to do. But don't go adding things that God didn't call you to do. Then he says here in verse 11, he says, let us, and here, here's kind of a twist of term, let us labor, what's labor? Labor is work. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into rest. Because it's labor. What we're talking about with Christianity, every religion is different, by the way. Every religion is different from Christianity in this. Because all religions say, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that. And Christianity says, you got to receive Jesus because he did it all. That's right. And you rest in that. That's what you rest in. Yeah. Amen, Let us labor 
to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And he goes all the way back to what we read in Numbers. Because unbelief is sin, and unbelief was keep us from inheriting. And then this next, uh, this ending of this chapter is real powerful. Verse uh, 12, for the word of God. Now he's talking about the word of God. And it says the word of God is quick. And that word means the word of God is a living entity. It's a living being. The word of God is actually God himself. The word of God is actually alive. Amen. Now I'm not saying the book is God. If, if, if the book was God and I threw it in the fire, I just burned God. Right? Which is, which really is kind of stupid if you think that people will worship an idol of, of wood as God and you can take that God and throw it in the fire right. and burn him up in the ashes, right? That's kind of dumb. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. You know, in Ephesians it talks about take the sword of the Spirit, right? The word of God is alive. And it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The Word of God can help you distinguish between soul and spirit. All of us on the earth have a soul. And what we... You know, when you have a good time, and you have emotions, that's your soul... Right? Your soul feels good. But you can see the same thing. You can go to the ball game. You can see people having a good time. You know that what's the difference? The difference is the word of God makes the difference. The word of God is the only thing that feeds your spirit. It's food for your spirit. It's the only thing that'll cause you to grow in the spirit. Remember, Jesus said this. He said, um, the flesh profiteth. Nothing, right? The flesh profit is nothing. So this is all about elevating the, getting you to understand what place does the word of God have in you. It's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing us asunder of soul and spirit. Most people can't out there, don't even know there's a difference between soul and spirit. I used to say, uh, listen to this guy who used to say this, uh, the preacher. He said, uh, you are a soul, you have a spirit, and you live in a body. And the, the Bible, the New Testament does say, you have a, you, there's a soul, a spirit, and a body. Now, we understand the body, right? But it's not so easy to separate what's the soul and what's the spirit. And some people say, well, the soul, the soul is where your mind is. Then you think that, what, the, the spirit is mindless? What about the man of the heart? You know, the, spirit, the heart of man. So, I mean, we, and we, we were reborn, we have a new human spirit. The world out there, they have a soul and they have a spirit, but their spirit is dead. Because the purpose of the spirit is, is one thing. It's to bring you into connection with God. When Adam and Eve were in the land, in the garden, they had a connection because their spirit was alive. In the day they ate, their spirit died. And now Jesus can say, ye must be born again. But people out there in the world, they don't get it. Why? Because you can't, they can't separate soul from spirit. To them, it's all the same thing. The way it's separated is only by the word of God. Now, watch, watch how, <coughs> how powerful this is. And God's word does this. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Remember when he said, uh, uh, you, you'll come to me and you'll say, didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do that in your name? And, and many, many, you know, we did all this stuff. And he said, I never knew you. You can be doing things for the wrong intent. And what it's saying here is, in the day of judgment, it's not so much what you do. It's why you did it. Did you do it because you love God throughout the world? Don't you, have, don't you have a lot of people? They love pride, right? We are, all, we are all tempted to it. God has put me in my place many times. Because you get, you know, you just go through this, you get cocky. 
is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that, in, in other words, anyone that's of this creation is not manifest in his sight. Whose sight? The Word, who is alive, who is God. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No creature is outside the sight of God. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of whom, with whom we have to do. There are people out there that they think they can commit adultery as long as the lights are off. God's not watching. Or whatever your sin may be, maybe God's not watching. That's why things are done in the dark. People think they're hiding. You know what? God don't need the light to see what's going on. Besides that, you can't sit there and, you know, you can't trick God. God knew what you were going to do. He knew why you went in that bedroom in the first place. He knew why you went over to that person's house. Now, I know I'm not talking to any of you, but I could be talking to somebody that's listening here. I'm not saying you're not listening, but somebody that might be listening uh, on the Internet. Anyway, uh, seeing then that we have a great high priest... That's Jesus, right? That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. In that word, we've seen that before. It's the same as confession, right? Let us hold fast our confession. What do you confess? The Word. The Word of God. Right? You're, it's all talking about the Word here. You have the word. The word is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two. And he said, let us hold fast to that confession, a confession of promises. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. You think Jesus doesn't understand you were tempted to do this or you were tempted to do it? Sure he understands. He was tempted for 40 days and nights in the, by the devil himself. Uh, just, uh, we got one last verse here, but any, can anybody tell me what, uh, how did Jesus beat the devil's temptation? It is written. Okay, it is written. It is written. It is written. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, if you put all this together, I believe this is what he's saying. He's saying the word of God is alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. He said, and, and, and he is inviting you. You can't go into the Holy of Holies in heaven. But G, he just said Jesus did enter in there, right? But the Word of God is already in there. In fact, Jesus, in the beginning, the Word was made flesh. He is the Word of God. Right. When He comes returning on that white horse, he's, He got His name written right on His hip. The Word of God, right? The Word of God is already in the presence of God. And when you, He says, he, you, you continue your, to keep hold on to that confession or your profession of faith because the Word goes into the Holy of Holies where the high priest is standing who can be touched with your infirmity. You say, God, I can't deal with this, but you've promised to deliver me. And that word is already there. You don't have to be uh, clean for God, don't, for God to answer. No. Don't think that because you sin. This is what happens. You sin and the devil comes and beats you up. It says, you sin, you're unworthy. You can, and some people will stay away from church for weeks. And months. And, months. and, and it gets worse and worse. And it, you get beat up. I, and so, another preacher used to say, I, I've heard a lot, a lot of wise preachers. But uh, one, one preacher said this saying, he said, don't run away from God when you sin. Run to him. That, that really is the gospel, right? Come to God understands everything. He's paid the price. He doesn't expect you to be a super giant. He's the super giant. We're just flesh. We're just from the ground. We're, We're just flesh. flesh. None of us is perfect. It's easy for us to to uh, to look at one another and say, you know, how come this person doesn't do this and that, this way or that way? You know, it's not my way or the highway. It's God's way or the highway, right? So it's not my way or the highway. So, uh, any questions that 
we finished uh, another chapter in Hebrews. Yeah. Um, how can Cain be of the tribe of Judah and be a Gentile? There's some, uh, the, the, the word Caleb, the name Caleb actually meant dog. And, uh, of course, Jesus talked about uh, the dogs as if, you know, being uh, n- not in the covenant. But I've heard some someone uh, teach on, and this is in a commentary somewhere, and I don't even remember where I read it, that um, Caleb, it, it seemed like maybe Caleb's, it was believed that Caleb's mother was a Gentile. And so, and even though he was of the tribe of Judah, and so people looked down on him. And you can imagine, you know, because it's like Peyton Place. You ever, well, a lot of people don't even know what that is. It's an old series, and uh, it was about the, the, how the town mistreated certain people that didn't quite fit. They, did, they, 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 weren't, they didn't live up to the, the city's... Uh, or the village's standards, and so they mistreated them. Well, Caleb was getting that. And here Caleb is the one who stands in faith at the end. And what's remarkable when you go through the genealogy of Christ, you can see all these things that should, like Rahab the harlot. She's right in, she was in the genealogy of Christ. You're talking about 40 days, or the number 40 being a time of testing. I was wondering about... Noah in the ark, and it rained and poured for 40 days. That's exactly true, yeah. So, he was already in the ark, and he was being saved. What was the test? Was it before that, after that, or was it? does it mean something else? Maybe the test was, his, now that Noah is in the boat, and his family, his family's probably murmuring too, saying, what are we doing in this boat? How are we going to survive? It stinks in here. Do you know how bad it stunk? They look out there, but, flooded. Yeah, but the, yeah, they look out there, and, and of course they couldn't get to the window unless they really got up because it was at the top, right? They could look out there. But I read something um, on the Internet that said, uh, and I believe everything that's on the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out, brother. <laughs> it said that they had somebody sent a droid. You know, it's illegal to fly above... Drone? Mount, a drone. Or, or, a drone. Yeah, a drone. Uh, it's illegal to fly above the, uh, the Mount Ararat. So they sent a drone up there, and they're trying to get pictures of the ark. Yeah. Because the Turkish government won't let them up there. Because what happens if the, Turk, if the Turkish, if the Muslims... Um, if the Muslims allow them to find the ark and it finds out that it exactly confirms the Bible, then that's going to kind of put a, th- a thorn in their side, right? Even though they believe that there was a Noah, mm-hmm. but they say you can't, the, the Bible's not trustworthy. Only the Quran is.